I want to welcome everybody to uh, the lecture on the Russian avant-garde, uh, where we will discuss uh, the primary work, um, kind of the, 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 the movers and the shakers of this movement, though there will be a few ancillary people as well that we will cover. Uh, the, the most famous participants in the Russian avant-garde that have an international name are Vasily Kandinsky, Kazimir Malevich, and Mark Chagall. They are referred to generally as the Russian avant-garde, but since many of them came from the Ukraine area and Kiev in particular, they are just as often referred to as the Ukrainian avant-garde. And there were lots and lots of influences that brought their movement to pass. We are going to discuss the art for art's sake and the utilitarian movement, Helena Blavatsky and the theosophical ideas that she was proposing in the um, 1860s and 70s and 80s and beyond. And then we will talk about Odilon Redon, who was one of the most well-known symbolist painters, Sigmund Freud's psychoanalytic theories, our American William James, who will coin the phrase stream of consciousness. We will also talk about Eugene Chevroy's color theories, the analytic and synthetic cubism of Brock and Picasso, the ultra modern movement that came to be known as futurism, and also the Bauhaus aesthetic. Now, what happened in the 1800s that was consequential for the art world, because the art world is always representational of its life and times and the various uh, interesting aspects of ideas that are being proposed uh, in their particular period. So what we know is that John Ruskin, who was a British utilitarian philosopher, proposed that making art was not such an essential thing, that it didn't improve people's lives that were being exploited by the Industrial Revolution, or whose lives were um, very difficult and consequently the aesthetic of the art world was not going to touch them in any particular way. So he was a man that supported the arts and crafts movement because he saw it as a way to support art and make it a utilitarian object to enjoy and to improve people's lives. His counterpart was Théophile Gautier, who was French, and uh, he was a man that was interested in art simply for its, uh, its contributions. And he gave artists sort of a right of, um, of creating art for the purpose of changing the world by them being the proponents of change. So the Art for Art's Sake movement affirmed that art was valuable simply as art and that artistic pursuits were their own justification and that art did not need moral justification. He said, in fact, art could be morally neutral or even subversive. Well, this is one of the first times that we begin to understand that art can have uh, an impact on society if the artist goes against the grain and proposes new ideas that go against what is typically considered correct. This is going to give artists a license to drive, as I said, because they're going to become more prominent as a voice for change. Now, among the people that were the most affected by these two ideas, were the utilitarians uh, who fashioned their, uh, th they fashioned their world into a, a, an applicable art form. They were the Victorian artists, and though they made lots of just typical art, paintings and sculpture, they were involved with the ideas that became a, a big focal point for William Morris. William Morris came from enormously wealthy family resources. 
Consequently, he used his wealth to uh, create workshops in which he would employ craftspeople. In this way, what he was attempting to do, because the William Morris Company initially in the 1850s was supporting artists that were designing wallpaper, designing fabrics, uh, tapestries, glass works, ceramics works. They were making clocks. They were making objects that people could buy. <clears throat> that not were, some of them were not terribly elegant pieces, but had elegant lines in them, which we will see in a few moments. But William Morris was interested because he was one of the first prominent socialists of his era in which he was not only going to pay artists a fair wage, but he was also going to protect the arts and crafts of the people making those objects. He was trying to protect the crafts because they were uh, already going out of style and were uh, being advanced by, uh, the arts and crafts were being intruded upon, I guess I should say, to make it more clear, by machine pressed and machine made objects. He understood one thing for sure, and that is that the arts and the pieces of beautiful objects that were made for people to have in their home, if they were touched by the hand of an artist, they had a soul. They had a particular kind of aspect to them that you could not replicate by punch pressing them from a die in a machine. Now, one of the things that he knew, of course, was that if you had to pay a, a craftsman a proper wage, a living wage, it would make even simple objects more expensive. So his idea was that even though people might not be able, say people of the middle class, to have a, a household that was outfitted by the heart and love and passion of an artist, by having their furnishings made by them, by having clocks and so on made by them, um, they would, if they're middle class, they could possibly afford to have these lovely things, but if they were just average everyday people, perhaps they will begin to accumulate little pieces at a time until they could afford to have a home that looked this way. Now, what you notice in the William Morris kind of designed household is he's creating a lifestyle. He's creating a lifestyle in which furnishings are not as overstuffed and made of, of uh, tapestries and very famous, uh, excuse me, and very expensive fabrics, a lot of uh, labor hours spent on chiseling and making elaborate woodwork. It's much more simplified. But what he's doing essentially is creating the minimalist movement, which is still in place today. And that is to say that his ideas were that less elaborate, more functional, and consequently more uh, affordable. So this is the kind of home that you would have if you were, say, a middle class person. And certainly if you were a person of greater means, you could have a home that is still very elegant, very beautiful. All of these various designs were made by the William Morris Company to make this kind of a lifestyle in which your home is a sanctuary as opposed to a, to, a, to a place that is just full of all kinds of nonsensical decoration. This is the way the typical Victorian home looked on the inside. On the outside, it was also overdone with lots of dental work and lots of extraneous decoration that really served no purpose. And in the inside of the home, you can see that many of the objects that this person would have purchased uh, are already machine made and or, or parts of these objects are already machine made. Consequently, there's a feel in which this person's home looks more like a museum that's done in bad taste. Whereas say in a home like this, this too looks somewhat like a museum with lots and lots and lots of extraneous objects that make you look wealthy, 
but there's very little light in the home and everything is overdone and you almost can't breathe. So we know that there is a movement then with the William Morris Company to live a more practical, though it can be an elegant life. Now, another very important point of interest that happens at this juncture is Helena Blavatsky, who is a Russian mystic, uh, spiritual author, a woman that believes that the average person can have a bigger life by understanding what the commonalities are between all religions. And all religions generally at their core are trying to elevate the person spiritually so that he can have, um, say, the, the most potential for his level of apotheosis, of his flowering. She thought that church dogma was too rigid and lots of people were leaving churches because it was a, a one way of thinking about the world and that church dogma was rigid and it didn't give the spiritual component that is important to enliven a person's soul. Consequently, she was proposing that people uh, have this understanding of the, the continuity of all of these ideas that come from a love for mankind and an expansion of your religious beliefs. Well, the art world naturally always wants to capture, as I said, the spirit of its times. Something like this is ethereal. It's something that lives in the, in the, in the air. These are not the kinds of things that you can necessarily pin down and make a representational picture of. But Odilon Redon does attempt to do that. What he's doing is he's not representing the, uh, the, the things that you can see in real life, but the things that you feel in your heart and in your mind. And it has the, the spiritual intention of conveying something that goes beyond what you see in the real world. Well, he's not the only one that's interested in spirituality. Many people are interested in spirituality, and they're also interested in the theories of Freud. Well, one of the things that Freud makes very tangible is he gives us keys with which we can discuss the human mind, and he creates a vocabulary that is specific to that with, say, the id, the ego, and the superego. But the other thing that he promotes is that we have to understand that realities are different for everyone and that realities are always changing. So again, we have the art world coming into this idea by making representations of that very specific thought. And that is that, say, Monet's work what he's doing here as showing us that reality is an ever-changing process by painting the very same venue over and over and over again and showing you how it changes different times of the year and even different times of the day. Still, we can see that in the works of Monet, we also have this added component of uh, experiencing the sensations that he experiences as he's looking. This is the reason his strokes are unique at this time, uh, when the French Impressionists are making these kind of uh, deeper strokes with more paint and so on. But what happens in the works of Cezanne, who is also conveying the same ideas, that looking at the same vista, he is painting it in such a way that a uh, being that he's an intellectual and perhaps even a deeper thinker, or a person that thinks in, in sort of a different, um, in a different way in general, he painted Mont Saint Victoire 60 times or more. And what he was doing was showing you how his moods change and how his work becomes more and more abstracted because the human mind has a unique way of thinking about various aspects of life. You can see why he will become the father of Cubism because by 1906, his work is significantly abstracted and Cubist. Now, all of these ideas were interesting to everyone that was a thinking human being. 
William James, who is an American that is a physician, who is a mystic, who's a teacher, who's a spiritualist, takes all of the, these ideas into account. He was also a psychologist. So consequently, uh, he is the man that coins this phrase, stream of consciousness. And what he tells us about stream of consciousness is how the human mind works, in which it is constantly thinking, although quite often the thoughts are not necessarily connected, they go back and forth. But when he introduces us to this concept, which we probably were all aware of, but not as, as keen to maybe investigate, well, the literary and artistic world gobbled this idea up right away because what it created for them was an opportunity to convey their thoughts in a way that were naturally happening in their mind. And it was able to create a new style narrative. Well, naturally, Virginia Woolf and James Joyce are very well known for stream of consciousness literature. And what abstract art will become in many ways is essentially a poem in color. We will see in a few minutes why even Kandinsky adds these kind of bars, because he is a man that is very sensitive to music. So quite often in his work, you see these kind of almost representations of, of scales and, and kind of this illusion that is taking us back to uh, how the composer works. But what we do see in his uh, original works when he's doing an investigation of how color works in particular is that he will be, as most artists, will be greatly influenced by the works of Eugène Chevroy. Chevroy is a color theorist that begins to write about the profound impact that color has on the human eye and how it translates on our soul. This was his idea, that it has a way to change the way we think about the world by the colors that we see in art. Well, so what we are seeing here that uh, Kandinsky is doing is he's doing an experiment based on all of these ideas. And eventually he will come to the conclusion that, that uh, color, acts on our interior emotions in the same way that music does. The, but even precursors, because Chevroy was writing in the 1800s, so even precursors of um, the works of the abstract artists are the Fauves. So the Fauves are generally, say, looked upon as 1890 to 1905 or so, what the Fauves like Henri Matisse, André Duran, and others like him were saying is that colors can represent emotions. This is directly taken from Chevroy's ideas. And uh, consequently, what we see with the works of Matisse in this case is he is not the least bit interested in representing the world as it appears but he is interested in moving you as the person viewing his work by the shapes and the colors that he uses so that he can create a certain mood with them. He's doing this kind of work around 1905, 1906. And we know that Kandinsky, like many other, as, as all artists do typically, is they're very, very well aware of what is cutting edge what everyone is doing that has a name in the art world they're interested in. So this, this Kandinsky's work made in 1902, he's living in Germany, he is a Russian uh, artist living in Germany at this time. Most of his life will be spent outside of Russia. He too is investigating how colors affect human emotions, and this is precisely one of the studies that he makes. But one of the things that he does, which was really lovely at this time, is he begins to, on a visit to Russia, he begins to make these kind of what he calls neo-primitive paintings that have to do with elevating the status of the common man 
to uh, having him be uh, in, on the canvas. So this was kind of a new idea. This was being proposed during this nationalistic period in the European world where people were taking pride in the place where they came from and in their folk arts. So what we see here is, 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 is a, uh, the folk tradition that is making this kind of toll painting or folk art. And what he, we see his translation is that this is obviously quintessentially Russian because we see that the headdress is a familiar uh, folk art form there, the headdress for the woman. And uh, the onion roofs, which very obviously represent the skyline of Moscow. And also even the kind of the dress that they would make for ceremonial celebrations for the horse. In addition to that, he made another piece that went with this that celebrated the folk arts of country people living around the rivers and the decorations that they made of their boats for various ceremonies and, and competitions. Now, as it happens, Kandinsky had a profoundly uh, unusual, uh, I guess, physiological sensitivity, you can say. And that is that he had a disorder known as synesthesia. Synesthesia is a wonderful thing to suffer from uh, or a syndrome to have in general if you're going to be an artist because when you hear music, you see color. Well, this was a good addition to his toolbox, if you will. Uh, and you, we, we will see in later years, he has this keen association with composers and poets and artists, and he also has this this, this kind of way of seeing the world, uh, he's going to be manipulating colors then in, in many ways from the get-go. When he even begins his art uh, in the 1900s and the Fovis movement is dominating the scene, then he's going to use these very bright colors and he's also going to start distorting his work because he has this interest, as I said, in color theory, and uh, he, he's interested in spirituality, and consequently now these distortions start to um, slip away from the realism that we see there on the left, and they, his work becomes more and more distorted. And so he continues on this path during doing all of these various experiments because he begins to understand that art, he says, will be like music. It will have that kind of internal effect on you. It will move you emotionally. Well, since this is a big area of interest for him, he is going to write a booklet on the spiritual in art. He will write it in German, and he will take into account all of the teachings of Helena Blavatsky, and it will be a great deal, um, uh, it will be of great deal of interest to all people that are working in the arts. Now, Alfred Stieglitz in the United States uh, has an art gallery, which he must depend on to um, pay his way in life essentially and he's also one of the premier photographers of the united states and he prints a journal a world-class journal known as camera work uh, because he's so interested in these aspects that are these very very new aspects of, of uh, how art is going to be perceived and experienced by the public he is proficient he's bilingual He's proficient, highly proficient in German. So he is going to translate with Kandinsky this uh, concerning the spiritual in art. And he is going to publish excerpts of it in Camera Work magazine. This will have a profound effect on photographers as well as artists because he's going to not only talk about camera photography and how it's moving along in the world in this journal, but he's going to uh, be producing one of the most revered art journals of its time as well. 
But this, these are some of the excerpts, the quotes as to what Kandinsky says. Abstract art defines modernism in the greatest sense. Abstract painting requires contemplation to reveal its meaning. For the 20th century, expressing inner impulses and raw emotions would make art much different than it had ever been before. The private self is far richer and more complex than the outer world and consequently its output can be limitless. Wow. This made a significant contribution to the modern art world. Because at this juncture, what we understand is if, you, if an artist taps his creative ideas and he doesn't have to represent the natural world, then as Kandinsky says, the output can be limitless because your imagination as an artist is limitless. Also, Kandinsky was saying, listen to the voice in your head, and in this way, your sensitivity and your emotions can be transferred to the canvas. Well, uh, this is obviously this connection of using shapes and colors to convey your ideas, your thoughts, your emotions, your impulses, uh, coupled with this interest in the fauves and in the contribution of cubism, which is going to be the great contribution of Picasso and Brock. Initially, they will promote analytic cubism, where they're looking at a cafe table in a Parisian restaurant, and they're sort of letting their eyes flutter over the table. And as you know, you don't look at something just full on all the time, but your eyes are always sort of moving around uh, the objects that you're looking at. They're making a lot of little pictures and composing it in a big picture. Well, again, this is a celebration of an abstracted representation. It is a celebration of the creative mind. Now, we're going to discuss this a little bit further, but what is going to happen by the time that Marcel Duchamp is making this work in 1912, 1913, is that we will be full on involved in the age of motion, in the age of speed. And consequently, uh, again, the artist is trying to make a representation of what is uh, furthermost on everyone's lips. So what he does is he takes the works of Brock and Picasso and this age of speed and this age in which you can have a moving camera and, uh, and study individually every frame. He has made this composition of a nude woman descending a staircase and he turns her into a machine from the knee down it is representational of this skirt on a locomotive. So his work actually is one of the first few works that comes to be known as futurism. Now, after Picasso and Brock sort of work and work and work in this analytic uh, synthetic, I mean, excuse me, analytic cubism movement, they move on to their synthetic phase. And their synthetic phase is a lot like collage because they used um, a wallpaper or pieces of newspaper or sand that they embedded in their work to add texture to it. So what you have is something that is known as assemblage or collage and their work becomes more colorful and very flattened. And so it's just sort of a new era that they are um, attempting to, to uh, broaden their view of, of, of their art. Now, the Russians uh, are going to be influenced by Henri Matisse's fauvism. They're going to be influenced by Picasso and Brock, their analytic and synthetic cubism phases. And they're going to use those languages to create their own language by taking those ideas and reconfiguring them according to their own individual passions and their own interests and frankly, their own intellect. 
But what happens initially with, uh, with Kandinsky, he sort of gets the, roll, uh, the ball rolling for the uh, Russian abstract artist, is that he will make it known through his journal there the on the spiritual and art of all the arts abstract painting is the most difficult it demands that you know how to draw well that you have a heightened sensitivity for composition and for color and that you be a true poet the last is in, is essential well then, if, if Kandinsky is saying to us that you be a true poet as an artist, then obviously this is a poem. This is a poem. For Kandinsky then, uh, the way that he sees life now as an artist is that you are making poetry on canvas, which has the same rhythm and flow that music has, and it has repetitions and surprises and movements and counter movements and your color choices are the equivalent of the notes that a composer would use to make his work. Now Malevich is interested in cubism and he is also very interested in uh, giving respect to the peasant class so we already saw in his work when he made the works that he considered and, and, and labeled neo-primitivism, uh, he's interested in elevating the status of the worker because now 1912, we, we were smack dab in the middle of the Russian, Russian Revolution. And he is responding by say, elevating the status of the proletariat man, the simple man, and joining it with those ideas that are being proposed with cubist workers and even Fernand Leger, who you will see in a few moments, who does something that he calls cubist, like tubes, because you see tubes everywhere because of industrialization. So he uses shading and fragmentation and, and even a little bit of futurism here because you see this looks a lot like aluminum. And he also begins to create his own language, which he calls suprematist compositions. And why in particular does he call it suprematist? Because suprematism to, he, to him means that there is a supremacy of pure artistic feeling when you do away with everything that is extraneous except color and shape. So this is his language. He is going to uh, also show us, because that's one of the things that artists do, is they say, it's like a poker game. They say, I see what you have, and I will raise you what I have. So now what we have is, of course, naturally, he's going to be well aware of the, the big, um, the, the, the big success of Picasso. Brock, unfortunately, is going to serve in World War I, and he will uh, be out of the picture from this point forward in many ways. But Picasso is going to go from strength to strength with his synthetic cubism. So this is Malevich's response to all of the, those ideas together. So what do we see here that Malevich is doing that is so interesting? Well, for one thing, it looks like he has cut up this uh, canvas in sort of a cubist fashion because we can see that he's geometrically dividing the planes here on the canvas. He's also uh, doing these things that are very colorful as synthetic cubism does. And he's adding these kind of disparate elements like a sword and a candle and this and that. So it looks a little bit like stream of consciousness and it also then stream of consciousness will eventually evolve into surrealism because though our thoughts are not connected, we have thoughts that are all over the place and certainly you can see. This is a representation of sort of the combination of all those things and ideas that are, and thoughts that are all over the place. Malevich was a teacher to many people that wanted to study with him and one of them was uh, Lvova Popova. 
or Pop yeah, Popova. Uh, so she is making this kind of work, which you can see also heavily influenced by analytic, synthetic cubism. If nothing else, it is certainly influenced by cubes and shapes and colors. And being that she's a girl, she might like pink more. But what we see with her work that is kind of very sweet is she um, adds an element that is not so easy to see right away, but her triangles seem to be floating in space. The, uh, the, just the, the, the general shapes seem to be stacked and moving and there's very sympathetic feel to her work here when she's doing this kind of initial contribution to what her ideas in cubism can be according to her synthesis. And then here we see that she's doing something that is futuristic. There's lots of movement here. And there's a, a abstracted elements here and semi-figurative uh, objects as well. So we see that she is taking into account all of these various interests. And she is also uh, attributing the shading and the way that Malevich did those tubular uh, representations here. And we see jutting edges that seem to extend beyond the framework. It's coming, it's, they're also floating. They're sort of coming into our, um, into our space. They're floating off the canvas and creating an energy that is floating into our space. She taught students also to make these kind, uh, she also became a teacher. So her students started to make these kind of constructivist, uh, representations in sculpture. As you know, sculpture always goes along and looks like the art of its period that's painted on canvas. So this is one of the reasons that her students are making this kind of geometric work. But let's not forget that her teacher initially said to her, the most simple representations, which are shapes and color, are the ones that are the truest spiritually. Well, she uh, is a practical woman. She wants work. She's going to go back to Russia after having been in Paris for a time as well. So uh, this is after the Russian Revolution, where uh, the artists that have been trained uh, in the new arts, in the abstracted cubist synthetic arts, um, are, are in Russia creating these kind of designs for magazines, for theater, uh, for journals of various kinds. And even here, what we see that she's doing is she's doing the decoration for magazine covers. And she also became a fabric designer that used these very simple shapes, which later will lead to Art Deco, by the way. Art Deco design will be very, very similar to this. And here we can see a flapper, essentially. These are flappers as they tied these kind of their waistline was dropped to their hips. And uh, her um, fabrics uh, will be, well, her designs will be used in, in the fabrics as well. And yes, she has another constructivist who is interested in all of these same things, in cubism and movement, in uh, poetry. He is a graphic designer, he's a painter, he's a sculptor and an artist, and also he worked in photo montage. So you can see that he's very clever with what he's done here. Archenko became part of the, uh, the movement that was, uh, with Tatlin was interested in using these constructivist ideas for uh, applicable purposes. In the same way that Popova's work was done to make fabrics for women uh, in a, and even fabrics to decorate your home with and curtaining and, and, and uh, furnishings and so on. So we have these two men who are not only interested in, in making art that is interesting to look at and interesting to contemplate, but uh, they, are, they want to have a direct application in making large scale sculpture that can inspire uh, architects to make these kind of buildings. By the way, I shouldn't bring this up, but I can hardly help it. 
Uh, this is going to be used by IM Pay some 80 years later for a um, building that he will design on these principles. In any case, in the moment, we are in the 1920s, and we know what is going to happen in the Russian world. The Russian world is going to experience this devastating revolution, uh, and they will have to get to work to build a country. And one of the ways that you can build a country and use the most inexpensive materials and the most inexpensive design is primarily with corners. You, you just make simple shapes, uh, you use and design uh, buildings according to what can be punch pressed by a machine, and you just replicate the same shape over and over again, and this is how you put up a building. You also don't use expensive materials because after all, this country is looking toward proletariatism, and the proletariat is the opposite of the bourgeois, and consequently, you use the kind of materials that are the least expensive, concrete, glass, and steel, as opposed to marble and bronze and all of these things that are labor-intensive and very expensive. It transcended all of the art forms because, say, those people that were musical or more interested in music also wanted to get people into a spiritual space by playing the kind of music that came to be known as Zom, which you can hear on the internet, on YouTube. It sounds very spooky and uh, it's, it's a little bit disconcerting, but I guess it's the kind of music that could help you go into another place emotionally and um and and transcend the natural world and go say beyond or behind the human mind into a state that is elevated beyond realism or the real world now um naturally as we know these kind of ideas that are being proposed at this time are groundbreaking nobody can even get their head around some of these ideas that are being proposed about how the universe works and that the universe is knowable beyond anything that anyone had ever contemplated and in addition to that we have this age of speed we have the beginning of the age of speed where there are increasing modes of transportation and they're all being sped up dramatically. So as I said, this is the reason that we get this. And this futurist movement toward being represent, represented in, uh, on canvas, uh, one of the futurist movements that took place that was the most prominent actually was in the Italian world and Giacomo Bala is so excited with his expression and his expansion of uh, it, uh, it, he's so excited about the expansion of the world I guess because due to speed and um, and uh, that, that, that's that, that what he's doing is is basically making a picture that is distorting or expanding speed and space and time. He's so excited that he can't even keep his painting inside the canvas. It comes right out on the frame. In, the, in this same way, what we see that Malevich is doing here is he's taking all of these same components. He calls it suprematism, cubo, cubo futurism. It doesn't really matter what he calls it. But we know that what is going on here is that he is combining all of these ideas. And naturally, it's very beautifully done because he really understands which colors sing together and which don't. We, in, in a way, he gives you a place to rest here. He's really a genius. He gives you a place to rest here because there's so, so much commotion and energy that is going on here, the human mind has to find a place to rest when it looks at art. Well, that's a side note. What we have also with another woman that is interested in all of these aspects is Gancherova, who does this as a Cubo futurist work. 
And she too is a painter and a costume designer, illustrator, set designer. She's going to work in the arts because it's a practical way to apply these new ideas. And this woman as well, Alexandra Exter, will not only uh, include all of these ideas in her works as well, but she is going to work as a prominent costume designer, designing uh, various magazine covers as well, and culture magazines. Well, what happens in 1905 with the incident that is known as the Battleship Potemkin incident uh, is that uh, no one knows yet, but the Russian Revolution is going to effectively begin at this point. And it will continue for 12 solid years in which the Bolshevik Revolution is going to have devastating effects on the Russian world. There, <clears throat> obviously an economic slump, there's no question that when uh, oh, our country is in civil war. There's going to be a devastating economic slump, but there are going to be food shortages and, and terrible working conditions and government repression and the, the push and pull of the Romanov family trying to stay in place and uh, the, the people that have had enough of everything and the discontent of the populace is not going to be dismissed. Well, the events that are going to be taking place here are going to affect Malevich because he's going to serve in World War I. And he's, he's going to serve as, a, um, as an officer in World War I. And he's going to see horrible and incomprehensible things in Russia uh, with starvation and cannibalism that is going to take place in Russia. This is how desperate people will be to survive. They will even have boy soldiers that are going to serve on the front. And then after he sees this in Russia, he's going to be sent out, I think, near the German front to see th this horror. Now, it's going to be quite an interesting thing that both Malevich and Walter Gropius, who will be the man that will found the Bauhaus, are both going to serve in World War I. And rather than coming back and just falling on a, a depression that will overtake them that they can never recover from, they decide that they're going to do everything they can to build up the world and make it a better place. So what does Walter Gropius do? Walter Gropius decides to found a school called the Bauhaus from the German word Bauen, to build. So what we can see that happens with Gropius, this is 1919 when this happens. He founds this school and they're going to move to this location uh, where the students and the teachers are going to build this school. And uh, it's called Bowen House, the building house, because they want to build up the world rather than tear it down. This was uh, a campus that had dormitories on it and teachers, uh, uh, teachers accommodations, their own little houses and so on. And then they had uh, the, the workspaces. This is one of the first buildings of its kind that will have a wall of glass. <clears throat> and this is in fact going to lead to skyscrapers all over the world, this wall of glass. Before, before Walter Gropius went to war, he was an architect uh, and he came from a long line of, fa of uh, family members who were architects through the years. He built this factory, this shoe factory, uh, in which uh, this wall of glass became his first initiative. And, uh, and, th and then later, of course, this one will become the one that will be more sturdy because he will have had the experience of having, uh, excuse me, he will have the experience of having built this um, factory a couple of years before he went away. Well, obviously we can see the connection between these ideas. These ideas then are if the German economy is devastated and the Russian economy is devastated, so what do you do? 
you have to put up buildings, you have to try to create factory systems, you have to create employment for people. So naturally what you have to do is build everything as inexpensively as possible. Both of these ideas were being interchanged between the Russian and the German world. And what they uh, wanted to put forward in this philosophy of constructivism, it, is what, it was characterized by the use of industrial materials, glass, sheet metal, plastic even, steel, and geometric objects. Uh, the geometric objects are more easily reproduced by machine tooling, and their look is inherently proletariat, and excuse me for repeating myself. However, we know what they're trying to move away from. They're trying to move away from these very costly buildings. This is when you start getting this new uh, phrase that is being uh, used by everyone that is a designer. Form follows function. You design something for its utility, taking into account how much money you have, and therefore, though this chair looks terribly uncomfortable to sit in, it does serve as a chair. And uh, we know that, that building with these very, very simple building materials, you can put up a home and the interior naturally has to fit the exterior or it's gonna be a very weird situation if it's all simplified and decorated with color to make it more interesting and appealing that we can understand that Piet Mondrian, who comes from this part of the world, is making the kind of painting that would look very nice in here. And he is replicating the same idea, sort of the geometry of living. Now, what does Walter Gropius want to achieve with the Bauhaus? The ultimate aim of all creative activity is building. The decoration of buildings was once the noblest function of the fine arts, and fine arts were indispensable to great architecture. Let us create a new guild of craftsmen without the class distinctions that raise an arrogant barrier between craftsmen and artists. Let us conceive and create the new building of the future together. Well, who would have thought in 1918, 1919, that this man could have been so profoundly imbued with seeing the future. He wanted, in his manifesto, he said, he wanted to uh, cultivate men that would want to build crystal palaces and to make the world a place that reaches toward the heavens, uh, buildings that reach toward the heavens that are a crystalline symbol of the faith that is yet to come. Well, who is going to work with him at the Bauhaus other than these other very talented people that will have big futures in their own rights as designers and decorators and architects? This is Walter Gropius and this is Vasily Kandinsky. Kandinsky, who is a man that is going to lose all his wealth uh, and Malevich as well, they're going to lose everything that their families ever had in the Russian world and consequently lived outside of Russia because they didn't want to live under communist rule anyway. Malevich will come back to Russia and he will, but Kandinsky will never go back. The point is that the teachers that are invited here are very new style teachers because uh, they are going to create a school that is both an arts and craft school slash technical school. They're going to teach young men and women uh, in their weaving workshop, in their wood cutting workshop, in their metal smithing. They're going to teach them how to use machines, how to produce dyes, how to do various things that will make architecture and interior design uh, a new way that can be replicated by the machine. They're going to go against the teachings of William Morris because they simply can't afford to make things that are as even as um, costly as the ones that William Morris Company was doing. 
They had to forget about the soul of the art and the craft. They were going to have to embrace the machine. The machine and man were going to have to be unified. This was the way of the future because both economies, and in particular, let's say in case we're talking about the German economy, they are so destroyed that they have no money to make anything with. In fact, the only thing that they have that the Bauhaus can begin making an object with to sell is, believe it or not, a chair. This is the first incarnation of the chair that they're going to make. And why is it specifically made of aluminum tubing and canvas? That's because from World War I, that was the only thing that they could get their hands on that, were, that, that there were vast resources of dumped canvas and aluminum tubing that was used for tents in World War I. This was found somewhere in a warehouse and consequently these were the two items that they could design with. They made whatever they could out of canvas and tubing. Later, when the school became a little bit more successful, uh, although the school only lasted for 14 years, but this is sort of the next way that they create a chair that's comfortable. They can't make a chair that has a lot of padding on it because it's too expensive and it's you know too many labor hours. So they make a chair that bounces, that can react to your body pressure on it. And in later years, they're going to make the what they will in honor of their beloved teacher, Vasily Kandinsky, they're going to design this Vasily chair which is high fashion, as you know, today in a minimalist house, not terribly comfortable, but we have leather here as opposed, they use canvas, but we today use leather quite often. And also, um, it's, it's, it's a chair that uh, will eventually be the director's chair. Well, they have numerous problems. The uh, art school has numerous problems, but they, they make decisions as, as best they can on even the simplest things. They stand for the common man and all of the decoration and the serifs that are added to fancy lettering, they're going to do away with. This is where we get this new sans serif font. They're going to do away with anything that has to do with, with the extraneous things. And they're even, just as often as not, they're going to paint, uh, excuse me, uh, print the Bauhaus name with not necessarily a capital letter, but a lowercase letter, because no one should be above anyone else. This is how uh, humanitarian they wanted their school to be. In addition to that, to those teachings that were fundamental to Kandinsky, who is going to be one of the most prominent teachers here, they're not going to teach the students art history from the beginning of time. They're just going to start with modern art. And with modern art, we can, we can say even say cubism. They're going to start with cubes. This is the reason why so much of the art that was made by Paul Clay or the art that was made by Johannes Itten is cubes. And not just cubes for the sake of cubes, but because they're going to design very minimalistic um, uh, sculpture pieces, like these pieces would have been. And they're also designing everything in a square motif. So the kind of art that would look good in a building that has these sharp edged lines that's geometric is geometric art and sculpture and furniture. Well, what happens with Itten, and there is a big focus here, by the way, on spiritualism, because Kandinsky is so into it. So this teacher, you can see, looks like a monk and even has his head shaved. When the students came into class in the morning, they um, would have something like we would consider not only meditations, but they would have uh, these like ohm style repetitious songs, something like that. And uh, now this man, Paul Clay, he served in World War I and he too was emotionally devastated by what he saw. You can see he serves in the German world by that hat. 
uh, by his helmet. And uh, he will come back here and create these kind of whimsical drawings because he was a survivor that was focusing on how the world can still be a magical place in spite of the horrors that he saw. What we can see with Kandinsky's work, before he came to the Bauhaus, he was doing these kind of, um, uh, not so many stark contrasts, but, but uh, there's, there's the, the colors are, uh, he's promoting the idea that colors are the friends of their neighbors and that uh, the colors of, are the lovers of their opposites, meaning on the color wheel. And his uh, work is softer and rounder, and it's going to change significantly at the Bauhaus. And in fact, this is considered to be one of his uh, great masterpieces of the Bauhaus, where we see geometric elements, triangles, circles, rectangles, half crescents, you know, these kind of parallel lines, crossing bars, everything seems to be floating but it's controlled and at the same time there's some light and there's kind of some heavenly association here with the skies and naturally you know planets and so on perhaps what has to happen then and why this happens is that the Bauhaus is just thinking of ways that they can make things with machines and these lines are sharp lines you can't afford to have these kind of elaborate things that were once made when labor costs were very, very cheap. And the wealthy would purchase this kind of a tea infuser. But now we're going to cater to people that can afford to have the simplest things only, but their lifestyle can be made uh, enjoyable by having objects that are aesthetically designed. This, by the way, is classic Bauhaus. This is what they did for the world. They simplified the world. They made objects that were streamlined and they made the kind of objects that were highly utilitarian and could be transported to people's homes in boxes where they would put them together, except for that one screw that they can't figure out where it goes. Now, this obviously is the system of business that was created by IKEA, directly exported from or imported, I guess you can say, from the ideas that were proposed by the Bauhaus. <clears throat> the Bauhaus design was clear and to the point. It wasn't fancy in any way, and it is used everywhere. Clear and to the point, bold colors, come at you hard and fast, you get the message. So the Bauhaus will define the 20th century, either through architectural, interior design, furnishings, stage design, graphics, industrial design, uh, all of these things that we see today everywhere around us is the progeny of the ideas that were born here. Chagall, who is the next man that was prominent in this uh, Russian avant-garde, was a man that was, perhaps he had a little bit warmer personality, I'm not exactly sure, but what, where he found his gratification in art was through uh, his relationship with the town that he came from, the little Russian town that he came from. So mind you, he is making us a picture that could be considered neo-primitivism because he's using representations of Russian art forms, this kind of toll painting that we would see in country work, even in the United States. He's also telling us what he thinks of this little town that he comes from and the townspeople in which the little village that he once loved and has been torn away from as he's now living in Paris is upside down. Upside down because the Russian Revolution is tearing everything apart at this point. And the other thing that he does is he's even including ideas from psychology and stream of consciousness, what he's thinking 
and how it sort of connects one thing to another. He even shows you that his face turns green when he thinks about his home. Now, um, so he's communicating with color, I guess is the point I'm trying to make. He's calling this neoprimitivism because Kandinsky gave it this title of neoprimitivism. But in this work, what you can see is he's also divided his canvas in kind of this cubist fashion. And it also looks surrealistic. So in this work alone, he's taking into account this neoprimitivism, He's also taking account the cubism that is analytic and synthetic with the colors that he's using and his influence of this surrealist aspect that we see in the works of Malevich. So I think we can come to a very firm conclusion that this is quite an expert piece. Now, Chagall is uh, going at some point to steal his way into St. Petersburg. Some of you who were with me in this lecture are talking about the Jewish life in the Russian world. Uh, Jewish people were not permitted, only a, a minute number of Jewish people were permitted to live in St. Petersburg or Moscow. They were sequestered in a place called the Pale of Settlement, and they certainly were not permitted to go to uh, to towns like St. Petersburg, even to visit, never mind to live. But what happened for Chagall that was fortuitous is that he crossed paths with Leon Boxt, who was a man that was also Jewish but permitted to live outside the Pale. He was the man that became the set and costume designer for the Ballet Russe. And uh, he was given exclusive rights to live in St. Petersburg and he somehow managed to get papers for Chagall to come to St. Petersburg and work as uh, a servant in someone's home. When Chagall was working there as a servant, he was able to go to the Hermitage Museum and he saw this work by Rembrandt. He was very, very taken by this work, by, the, by his uh, Rembrandt's use of light and shade and sort of the mystery. And this is a, a story from Greek mythology, Danaea, uh, the daughter of Perseus, the founder of Mycenae and so on. So he was so taken by this, but he, you know, what was he going to paint? A, a, a story from mythology? He took all of these ideas of the fabrics, uh, the, um, the lushness of the fabrics, of, of the uh, velvets and so on, and this light and dark and the sheeting, and he made a picture of his birth. He made a picture of his uh, birth. This is 1910-ish. And uh, he kind of goes back and forth between uh, going to Paris and not going to Paris, but eventually he realizes that uh, these kind of scenes are not going to, to be the way that he's going to make his way in the future. He will eventually marry a woman called Bella, and um, the two of them will fall madly in love, though at some point he's going to go to Paris and uh, come back thinking that um, the Russian world will be welcoming for modern artists. We'll see in a few moments what will happen to him. But he will live with her, I, I believe, for about 20-something years, and she will die in America, in the United States, in 1944. He, unfortunately, is going to be a man without a country most of his life because number one, he's Jewish, number two, he's in Europe, and he has to escape the Nazi incursion into Paris. But at this moment, what will happen for him is he will go for a short time to Paris where he's going to meet Fernand Leger. Fernand Leger, as we said at the beginning of this lecture, creates this work which is known as what he calls um, tubism, uh, you know, a work, uh, kind of a play on cubism. Uh, this is representing uh, kind of the industrialized world and how it's changing. And uh, the two of them will study in the same place and they will become relatively good friends. So this is one of the first works that Chagall makes that is fauvist in nature. 
So he is doing the kind of work that we would have seen Durand and um, Valadon, perhaps, and even Henri Matisse. Here, this kind of work is more geometric, which did not necessarily appeal to Chagall. However, what does initially appeal to him is this combination of cubism, synthetic and analytic, and also this dreamlike, surre dreamlike surrealism. But still, what spoke the most to Chagall was his little town and his upbringing and generally his history. That's one thing that made him different. He came from Russia. He was living in Paris now. Uh, he was conveying to us what life was like. Obviously, these kind of attributes that we have here are not realistic in nature. And they have all of those uh, attributes of geometry and cubism. And they have this surrealistic uh, component as well. But what he tells us is, is that life for a Jewish man in Russia is as precarious as a fiddler on a roof. And we also see that though he is in Paris at this time, he is blue or certainly not terribly content. He looks quite miserable and serious. He's thinking about the village that he comes from. And this is sort of like the Russian landscape. And again, he tells you he's a Jewish man. He is like the traditional menorah. The menorah has one uh, higher, usually the shamus. It has the, high, uh, you know, the, the, the center point, and it has six other branches. So he's showing you here. The thumb is then the parallel of this, and he has six fingers. Another thing that shows him to be very concerned about what's going on in his country while he's away is that people are being killed in the streets of, of uh, major cities all over Russia because of the Bolshevik Revolution. And he is very blue when he thinks about this little town that he came from, Vitebsk. In Belarus, the town is upside down. He includes in it this neo-primitism aspect. And he tells you that when he's in Paris and thinks about being in Paris, his hopes are brighter, yellow. But when he thinks about his family, he's very upset and discouraged. He eventually is going to go back to get Bella and bring her back. She's old enough. She's of marriage age. He includes in this work uh, the work of, of, of uh, folk people and also shows you kind of the excitement of what happens when you're in love. And these dreamlike and irrational landscapes that he uh, creates here are stream of consciousness and surrealist. Now, eventually what he's going to do is take Bella to Paris with him. Fortunately, her family was well off and uh, they were able to lend them some support. And the two of them uh, are in Paris for a time. When the Russian Revolution is over, he decides that he's going to go back to, to create a school and he initially finds, uh, you know, he's the founder of the Vitebsk, Vitebsk Art College and he begins to invite other um, avant-garde Russian artists to come and be part of this school. Now, his outlook on life, as I said, he is more attracted to this dreamlike aspect of of life, and this is what he's representing here. Others that wanted to be part of the school were not so keen on this altogether. And in fact, they sort of inched him out and Malevich took over the school. This was not on their agenda, and so consequently this pure artistic feeling that suprematist artists were more engaged in and these lines and squares and circles that were more uh, their vocabulary made him so uncomfortable that he eventually left. And he became an art teacher in an orphanage. 
but the, the bottom line was he had to get out of Russia and he was going, he took Bella back to Paris. And at this point, he um, is still making works that are obviously very dear to his heart. Although he was agnostic in every single way, we see that um, this kind of reminiscence of life and uh, in particular, quite often Jewish life in the pale, though it is now being completely transformed towards something that is fauvist and surrealist and dreamlike it is singularly biographical and what we know of of uh chagall's work this is you know the, his his work that we are famous with he and bella as i said eventually and their daughter end up in the united states during world war ii and she unfortunately is going to die at a very young age, I believe maybe 49 years old. She's going to die because antibiotics are being shipped to soldiers overseas and there's a shortage of antibiotics in the United States. He is going to live 92 years, uh, no, excuse me, 97 years. He's going to live 97 years and he will become extremely wealthy and well known. So he's going to make lots of gifts to the Jewish world and other places as well. It's not just the Jewish world. This happens to be, I believe, at the Hadassah Hospital, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel that are represented here as a gift that he made. Uh, but he also did the same in Chicago uh, and many, many other places. So I, I, I don't know them all, but he certainly made gifts to various, various municipalities. For the Knesset, the parliament building in Israel, he offers uh, these very large tapestries that were made, designed by him, of the mysticism and the folk traditions and fairy tales and biblical stories of the Jewish world. And on the floor, the mosaics are more like symbols of, of joy and life and abundance. But certainly we know that Chagall made a big, big name for himself as equal to Picasso, equal to Matisse in his use of color and use of expression and fantasy. Uh, unquestionably, he became one of the most renowned artists. But I have to go back to Malevich at this point because Malevich uh, was interested in forms and shapes and, and kind of was astonished by movement. So uh, his work quite often looks like it is moving in space. It, and he said that suprematism is supreme over reality. And a lot of uh, the flack that he catches is uh, the flack around this black square that he made. I think there are about four black squares in existence. Now, it's hard for us to think for a moment here, what, what can we contemplate? What can we get out of this, which looks like a whole bunch of nonsense? Well, this black square cannot in any way be displayed all by itself for the observer to understand what it means. It has to be understood in context. These uh, suprematist exhibitions that were taking place during the Russian Revolution and after were made as a representation of, um, of, of what, what is happening in their world that is unknown. There are lots and lots of questions taking place at this time in the Russian world. And we have to know what their traditions are to understand why he would have made this kind of exhibition with so many pieces. And this is what the Russian world uh, uh, sort of operates around, even until today. It had many decades of suspension when you couldn't have these objects. It became against the law. Once Stalin was put in place, or perhaps even Lenin, once they came to power, these objects had to be done away with because uh, religion was the opiate of the masses. It was also a way, of course, to drastically diminish the power of the church. But what happens here is that uh, every poor person in the Russian world, even if they are the poorest of poor people, have an icon's corner. 
And in this icons corner, you always have the most prominent piece very specifically that is placed in that corner in a way that we would never place a piece of art in the West that I've known of. So the icons corner, the most significant piece of art that was maybe the most religious, the face of Jesus himself, is right here. Whereas, say, pictures of the Madonna or other pictures with other people would not be as prominent. This was something that was part and parcel of the Russian world for centuries. So that when you look at this icon's corner that is so significant in its placement of that representation of Christ, then we can understand that something is going on here that is far deeper than what meets the eye. We can easily say that God is dead. I haven't seen this written anywhere, but this is what it looks like to me. What is going to happen to this prominent position of religion in people's worlds? Now, another thing that we have to be well aware of is Lenin was very pro-abstract art. Very, very, very pro-abstract art, which would be the antithesis of what we would think. But he was in favor of abstract art because it broke with traditions. And the, the new communist government was breaking with every single tradition that had ever existed in this world. They were creating a new world order. So that when Malevich was working then after the Russian Revolution in the arts, there was no uh, enforcement of, of, of what kind of art to make. Everyone was pushing forward toward, uh, toward a more modern world. Well, interesting thing is that when Lenin died, this was all done away with because abstract art requires contemplation, as we said. And if there's one thing that a dictator does not want you to do is think. A dictator does not want you to think. A dictator wants you to carry out his instruction. He prefers that you do his bidding. And from this point forward, after the 1920s, when Lenin passed away, Stalin did away with everything modern and certainly everything that had to do with modern art. There was no sculpture that was modern, geometric, nothing like that. What the only thing that was available to the Russian people pretty much in the art world was, say, stories of their history that were grand and glorious, but primarily it was all about Stalin. Every picture that people saw had to do with wheat fields that were abundant in wheat, which they were not, it was all a big lie, but it was Stalin with children and Stalin with flowers and Stalin with babies and Stalin being the great director. What is it that Stalin had to do? He had to build a working economy from a devastated country. And consequently, uh, if you were not going to follow the dictates and uh, follow the teachings of Marx and Engels and Lenin and Stalin, then there was a gulag with your name on it. And the gulags did everything they possibly could to repress any kind of artistic expression. This is why people were sent here. They were sent here because their political and artistic ideas were not in line with the dictator. Consequently, what we can say is, uh, what, what contributions are Malevich, is Malevich going to make to this, this kind of uh, country? Actually none, to be quite frank with you. He's, he's going to be closed down and his ideas were certainly not going to be perpetuated. So we have to see in, co in contrast to what kind of effect Malevich is going to have on future architects and future designers, because we know what is going to happen with uh, Picasso. Picasso's cubism, though initially people never saw any kind of application to anything with this, as a matter of fact, we all know that the 20th century is going to be in large part a, a, um, an answer to cubism, 
in every way imaginable. Say in this case, we're just talking about architecture. Frank Gehry loves and adores Picasso and his creative spirit. And the fact that cubism can be brought to light in this way, which is very obvious in these kind of designs, that this is essentially a building that is three-dimensional cubism. It is a cubist-style museum that inside it features cubist style and all kinds of other art. Now, Malevich was a very much uh, a, a, a breath of fresh air for Zaha Hadid, who was an Iraqi British architect educated in England. She unfortunately died not too long ago in Miami here of a, of, of a um, asthma attack, sad to say. But she is certainly considered one of the most prominent female architects of the century. She adored everything that had to do with Malevich because his world was always moving. His ideas were always sort of jutting into uh, spaces that you would not expect them to go. This is a drawing made by Zaha Hadid, a painting made by her. And this is a rendering of the uh, leisure club that she made designs for and the, it, it, was, it was located in the side of a mountain in Hong Kong, because Hong Kong, I think, is uh, overly mountainous, and there's not much place to build. It's a small place as well. So this was her design for this leisure building, all of it based on her love of the work of Malevich. In fact, every single building that she ever designed looked like it was flying. And uh, the tectonic, this uh, Malevich, which he called the tectonic series, in which he begins to show these shapes becoming more uh, complex than these, she designed a hotel that was never built, but she designed it after those shapes, and it was supposed to be so large that it would straddle the Thames at a certain point in London.